The next level of thing. Did you start? Yeah. Okay. So the next type of improper integral. The last one, we were approaching infinity as one of our limits. And we kind of liked that one. Because if I gave you a function on the xy plane, and I said, let x grow without bound, I can follow what that function looks like. It doesn't get weird, right? I might go off. I might go down. What we were doing were things that approached the x-axis asymptotically. And we sometimes got scalars. So last day we did problems of this nature. Okay, well, let me take something like this. This was fairly easy. And we went from 1 to infinity last day, didn't we? Ooh. Why don't you like this? You don't like this. But do you know why you don't like this? Because. What is the domain of 1 over x squared? What's the domain of 1 over x squared? In words. Is it all reals? Except zero. Except zero. So why don't you like this? Because I have a limit of integration that is not in the domain. So as stated, that's impossible. As stated. But can I manipulate it in much the same way we did last day? Yes, there's stuff on the other side, but I'm only looking at 0 to 1. So I'm asking you, now last day, what did we do? We did that, and we found out this one was finite. This is what we're doing today. Ooh, this is, this is quite different. It's still an improper integral, but it's improper for a different reason. I'm not taking a limit to infinity. No. So any suggestions how to start this one? Think of what we did last day. We just take the limit of a approaching zero. OK, so back up. So where does a live? Uh, on the positive side. Where does, that's a one, where, where, where's, you've got the right idea, where does my A live? Does it live over here? Does it live over here? Does it live in here? Okay. What if I find that area and then do what? You said take the limit as? Um, a go to uh, zero positive? From the positive, beautiful. Everybody catch that? Yeah. Perfect answer. <clears throat> this is exactly what we did last day. We calculated a finite area and then we took a limit. So if I calculate this area and then I have A approach 0 from the right, that is important because from the right and from the left in this case won't necessarily be the same thing. So, so we have as, sorry, as, uh, we'll, you, I, we'll, we'll use A. As A approaches 0 from the right of A to 1. 1 is not the problem. <coughs> That's not the problem. The problem occurs at the lower end because that's outside the domain. Well, is this a simple antiderivative, first of all? What is the antiderivative of this? Negative 1 over x. OK, so it's negative 1 over x. I'm evaluating from a to 1. OK, don't drop the limit, because if I drop the limit, I get an answer every time but it won't be the right one. So if I evaluate this at 1, then that will be negative 1 minus negative 1 over, so plus 1 over a. Hmm. Well, this looks relatively harmless. Ooh. This is one of those asymptotic ones, isn't it? Yeah. Now, whenever your denominator is approaching 0 and your numerator is not, that's called an asymptotic discontinuity. But it's actually not complicated. You know you're either going to get an infinity or a, the other way, infinity. an infinity or a negative infinity. My denominator is approaching 0 <laughs> positively. So that means this is growing without bound positively. With that statement, then what is the limit? Infinity. Whoa. Now, that seems kind of odd, doesn't it? When we looked at this side, it was, I think it was 1. But this side's infinite. Hmm. That's, at the very least, that's interesting, right? It's not an automatic thing, what I was going to get. Let's try another one. 
let's say we want, and, and by the way, zero to one, it doesn't really matter what my upper limit is. I'm starting with zero. That's the goofy part. Let's say I want to go zero to eight of one over the cube root of x. No, it's the exact same problem. Zero is not in the domain, so I cannot evaluate that directly. Hmm. So probably the same strategy. And we're usually going to be looking at things in the first quadrant, just to you know have some repetition. It's usually going to be something of this nature. Now, do I want to write this as 1 over the cube root? I've got to integrate something. What, what would you rather write? To the, careful, one third? Negative third. How about, neg there we go, negative one third, yeah. <laughs> Why? Because I can't integrate a root, I can integrate an exponent. All right, everybody cool with that? Okay, don't worry about the limit till the very end. So do the calculus on the stuff in the middle. So what is the antiderivative of x to the negative one third? 3 over 2 x to the 2 thirds. So it's x to the 2 thirds times 3 halves. And I'm going from a to 8. All right. So I have 3 halves times 8 to the 2 thirds. Cube root squared would be what? What do you make? 4 4. Minus 3 halves a to the 2 thirds. Hmm. What's this term doing? Where's it going? Actually, we sign language. Anybody got other than that? Going to zero. A is approaching zero, so this is approaching zero. Ooh. Over here, it was getting infinitely large because that a was still in the denominator, but that a is not in the denominator anymore. So therefore, what is the answer? Six. So six. Huh. How? Okay, that's crazy. But if you remember last time, when we did this problem, remember the infinite painters? We did this problem and we got finite depending on the exponent. Oh, so the bigger this exponent, the smaller this got, didn't it? But the smaller this exponent, it might diverge, like 1 over x diverged. Well, on the other side, you have a similar problem. This guy here diverges to infinity. But 1 over x cubed is still a similar shape. It's a similar shape. What happens is it just approaches the y-axis a little bit faster. Just like this one approached the x-axis pretty fast. The 1 over x cubed, if you graph both of them, they have a similar shape, but the 1 over x cubed is simply going to approach the y-axis a bit faster, creating a finite area between 0 and 1, where that one was infinite. So it's not one of these things where you just automatically can, can see it. It's, right? i got to do this. Okay. Any questions so far on this? Okay. Now, Well, obviously, this is just natural log x from negative 3 to 1, which is log 1 minus log 3. And that would be negative log 3. Everybody okay with that answer? I'm linking with my left eye. Huh? Are you okay with that answer? No. You can't be. Do you know why you're not okay with that answer? Because it's log. Is log 1? Log 1, 0. You're not taking a log of a negative number. You have absolute value. Um, no, you, you, you haven't taken a log of a negative yet. You will in the future, but not yet. My algebra is sound. It's my calculus that's flawed. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this? By the way, it is, it is oh, this is wallowing in wrongitude. Couldn't get much wronger. But wait a minute, where's the error? Um, what is the domain of 1 over x? 
What are my limits of integration? Negative three to positive one, is that a problem? Zero. Isn't zero smack dab in the middle of that? You just split it to two. Oh, okay, so what I just asked you to do was actually impossible. You didn't realize it was impossible because I'm really clever at asking impossible questions. I just asked you, <laughs> everybody see? Oh, that's not quite right. Yeah, I just asked you to integrate with the discontinuity in the middle. Yikes! So, how do I do this one? You have to do it from one to zero and then from zero on the left. To Beautiful, integrate. exactly. Chase is exactly right. In other words, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna create two improper integrals. No way around it. There's still time to change your majors, folks. Yeah. Can't do it any other way. Got to do it like this. This is a big yikes. But that's now independently we'll do each one. Okay? So I need a second letter of the alphabet. How about I use A and, I don't know, B? So in the first case, it's going to be the limit. Now, negative 3 is not the problem, is it? The problem is the zero. So let's say negative 3 to A, and A is approaching what and how? A is approaching what number? Zero. zero. And from which side? No. Uh, now it's approaching from the left, from isn't the negative it? side. Because I'm approaching from the left of zero. That, by the way, that actually does matter. And then on the other one, let's say it's B to 1. It's got to be a different number. And now B is approaching... Zero from the right. Beautiful. Treat these as two completely separate problems right now. We'll do them one at a time. Okay. So the first one, I keep thinking I'm grabbing blue. Did I not bring a single blue pen? I guess I did not bring a single blue pen. All right, we'll go with green. So the first one, well, what's the antiderivative of 1 over x again? Is it ln of x? Absolute value. Yeah, does the absolute value matter? Absolute value, yes. Uh, yeah. What happens if you take the log of a negative number? It gives you a domain error. You can take the log of a negative number, but it gives you an imaginary number back again. That's why it's giving you a domain error. No, no, absolutely you can take the log of a negative number. <laughs> we just don't want to take the log of a negative number. We want real stuff here. No. It, the log is defined at all real numbers except zero. But the log of a positive gives me a real number. The log of a negative gives me an imaginary. And, and when you go further in math, you will actually do that. But not today. Not today. So this is from negative 3 to a. And let's do this one to its completion. <clears throat> By the way, you can't evaluate yet because there's nothing there. I can't take the limit yet. I actually have to plug in the numbers first. So log of absolute value of a, because a is a negative number, by the way. Right. Minus the log of absolute value of negative 3. I'm going to say 3. That's finite. I'm not worried. Now, what does the log graph look like in general? Let's remind ourselves. That one. The fact that A is approaching zero from the left is not important because I'm taking its absolute value. So it's simply approaching zero, right? A is now, absolute value of A is a positive number, agreed? And A is approaching zero. So what does this equal? Negative infinity. Whoa. Because I am approaching zero, the logarithms are getting negative really fast. Uh -huh. So that, that half is negative infinity. We're done with that half. Um, last day, we loved it because we could take limits to infinity. They were kind of friendly. And most of the time, we got finite answers. These, most of the time, you're not getting finite answers. I just did an example where we got one. But most of the time, you're not. Most of the time, you're going to get infinities or worse. So because of the absolute value, when we're plugging it in A as it approaches 0 from the left, it's the absolute value of A is approaching plus. zero from the right. Yeah. 
And the reason is if, if A was approaching zero from the left and I didn't have the absolute value, that would be imaginary. Mm -hmm. Right. It doesn't so approach. There's no line over there. Imaginary numbers don't approach negative infinity. They just, it's, it would be evil. Yeah. Not that this isn't already evil. That would be like more evil. It would be kind of a cool evil, but it's still more evil. Now let's do the one on the right. All right, so this gives us then the limit as b approaches zero from the right of, again. Now, in this case, the absolute value will be redundant because I'm dealing with numbers that are positive. But that's still the, that's still the antiderivative. And I'm going to go from uh, b to 1. So this equals the limit as b approaches zero from the right of log 1 minus log b, and that b is positive, so I don't need absolute value. Log 1, of course, is zero. 0. And we just said, as b is approaching 0, this is approaching negative infinity, isn't it? So what's negative log b approaching? Plus infinity. Houston, we have a problem. I have a problem. We have to split it into two integrals. One of them is going negative without bound, and one of them is going positive without bound. This is, by the way, this is the most evil problem you'll probably ever see from an integral standpoint. And by the way, it's, it's not an argument. This is the universally accepted rule for several hundred years. In this scenario, where you actually broke it into two separate limits, what if both of these limits was approaching positive infinity? Both of them. And I'm adding them together. Okay. Then your limit is infinity. That, that seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? But because they're approaching different directions, this is maybe the only time you're going to see this. The answer is DNE. I was going to ask if it was DNE or all real numbers, but you answered the question. Be, and the thing is, this, this is this is exceptional. This is maybe the most evil. Man, we talked about you know. Now you go back in the integral of secant cubed, which we said was evil, but it was such a low level of evil in comparison. No, this one is truly evil. I have a problem. There was no way to do it without splitting it up, and I split it up into two pieces that went in opposite directions. Therefore, there is no answer to this question. It is a DNE. Yikes. But let's back up one step. What if it was 1 over x squared, where it's going to positive infinity on both sides? then both of my pieces would have been positive infinity and I'm adding them together. So yeah. getting an infinite answer in that case seems to make sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. This is what I'm saying is the exception. I got two answers and they went in opposite directions. It's a DNE. OK? I, I, I feel bad for showing you that one because that one, that hurts. That will cause bad dreams and things like that. It doesn't come up a lot in mathematics. But the fact is it will come up and you want to be able to answer it. What do I do in this situation? Um, I'm not sure if I asked you this question previously, but since the areas are equal for the the right half and the left half, for assuming it was you know negative one to one, mm -hmm. in that situation, would you be able to like, cancel that? Or, no. I mean, and, and you know what, Chase? Yeah. When I was a student, when I was a student, I asked that exact same question. Why can't we cancel them? Because first of all, they're not going at the same rate necessarily because they're two independent things and infinities can't cancel. Now, did we have a problem on the quiz you turned in last day where it was an infinity over infinity form? It was the third question. Sometimes, sometimes you can manipulate that. Unfortunately, this isn't one of them because degree doesn't figure in. I, I, can't, I can't make it into a, that usable quotient. Yeah. I, I fought tooth and nail when I was a student to try to get an answer, you know, and why can't we just cancel? It doesn't work that way. Infinities can't cancel. If infinities canceled, then every time you got an infinity over infinity form, your answer would be what? One. Yeah. One. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. And every time you got an infinity minus infinity form, your answer would have been zero. Or a zero times infinity form, because infinity is not a scalar. Infinity is not a constant. Infinity can only show up as an answer. It can't show up in the process. So we had two pieces. They went opposite directions. Like I said, pure evil. All right, we're going to walk away from that one. This is the least likely to show up kind of problem. The indeterminate forms we did last day are actually very common, and we're going to see those over time, and they will not intimidate us. Well, why will we see those ones? 
because we're going to start the sequence and the series section now, and we're always going to infinity. Every problem is going to infinity. So now the question really is, is it going to be finite or is it infinite? And it really won't be that troublesome. Okay, so the next thing. This is now what we're going to spend the next many weeks on. So, sequence. Now, there, this is a term that I found many math books don't really help in terms of the definition. They're, they're really vague and sometimes. And I want to make sure we know this inside and out. My Math 245 class, they just recently were working with sequences. And I asked them to define it. And half of them gave me a perfect explanation, perfect definition. The other half gave me the flawed one that, that the calculus books often do. Let me ask you a question. You think you can tell me the next few numbers? It's yeah. not a trick question. Yeah. What are the next few numbers? Probably. Five, six, seven. Five, six, seven. Okay. You think you can tell me the next few numbers? Yeah. yeah. Zero, negative one, negative two. Okay. So if I was to define this sequence. First of all, a sequence is infinite. It doesn't have a stopping point, but it does have a starting point. Would this be a correct way to describe this? I'll give you a hint. It's a trick question. And this is the flaw that most math books have right now. This is, I'll, I'll get, okay, this is an absolutely incorrect definition. There is no truth at all. What did I just write? Look at the notation. This is called a... No, this is called a set. I have a roster of names. I alphabetize them because it's more convenient. Could I put you in order by height, by age, you know, by, I don't know, how far you can see, how much you can squat? I, I, could, I could come up with a million different ways to put you in order. Every time I rearrange the order, does that change my roster? No. <laughs> so I'm going to go by height. Chase, you're no longer in the class because you, know, you don't have a height. No, it wouldn't matter what order I put you in. It's the same roster. In a set, there is absolutely no order and no order even suggested. So if I rearrange these four numbers, it's the same set. I rearranged these four numbers, and you all told me it was a different outcome, and that was correct. Uh -huh. A sequence is absolutely not a set. And the worst problem most books have, they start off by defining it as a set. <clears throat> nope, because the order in a sequence has everything to do with the sequence. In a set, there is no order. There's no order of my roster other than what I created artificially. So it's not an order. Or excuse me, it's not a set. It is an order. So the term I like to use is a sequence is an ordered list. Now. One of the things that most books will say is it has a one-to-one -one correspondence with the natural numbers. And that's a correct statement. What does that actually mean? What are the natural numbers? One, two, three, four, five, and so oh, on. Okay. That simply means there's a first term, a second term, a third term, a fourth term. There's not a pith term, or a root tooth term, or a three halves term, right? There's, when I'm counting the people in this row, I'm pretty much stuck with natural numbers, aren't I? I don't get to the 2.5th person, and you get or the pi. I like the pi person, right? There's one, two, three, four, and so on. So a sequence, we generally think of it like this: a1, a2, a3, dot dot dot. Eventually, a n, dot dot dot. That's kind of the universal way we describe a sequence. There's a first term, a second term, a third term, an nth term. Now, the nth term is the one that we pay the most attention to. This, the nth term, is often referred to as the general term. If I tell you the nth term of a sequence, then I don't need to tell you any of the terms in the sequence, because you automatically know all of them. So if I said, I'm thinking of a sequence, I'm thinking of a sequence, and the nth term, let's say, is you know 2n plus 3. Okay. Can you tell me the first few terms? Yeah. Okay. Let's go A1, A2, A3, A4, just for fun. What's A1? Five. Five. Seven. Nine. Eleven. Now 
That's pretty easy, wasn't it? <laughs> what if I started with 5, 7, 9, 11, and then asked you for the general term? Do you think you could work backwards in this problem to find that? Yeah, yeah you did that in remedial algebra. This is what's called an arithmetic sequence. It's, it's one of the easier ones to work with. If I give you this, I don't have to tell you any of these. Oh, by the way, what's the hundredth term? Uh, 203, did you have to do any work? Did I have to find the first 99 for you to tell me the hundredth term? No, we like that better. If I don't have to find any of the other terms. So a sequence is an ordered list. There is a first term. There has to be a first term, right? Because if I have an ordered list. Now, the second thing I like to say is it's an ordered list with an underlying pattern. Now, it doesn't always have to have a pattern. Actually, all sequences have a pattern. We just may not be able to see the pattern. And that is one of the most important areas in this part of the mathematical world, being able to see patterns. Now, one of my favorite, um, probably, uh, movie scenes. How many have seen A Beautiful Mind? How many have seen that movie? Russell Crowe plays John Nash, who was a tortured genius. You know, World War II and beyond. John Nash had the ability to see patterns that other human beings could not see. Uh, if those who have seen the movie, he, the, the DOD recruits him, and they take him to a room with a gigantic wall filled with symbols. They had, they had intercepted many, many Nazi transmissions. And they had all these symbols all over the wall. You know, numbers, letters, symbols. And do you guys remember this scene? He, he sees literally symbols coming off the wall. There's tens of thousands of symbols, and he sees patterns. And he was able to do something. It was the starting of a branch of mathematics called cryptography. Does, it, does anyone know the slang for that? Code it's code breaking. By the way, if you're a computer hacker, that's your goal. If you're the software engineer, what are you trying to create? Code. Firewalls to keep people from breaking the code. <laughs> no, it's just a constant game, isn't it? The firewalls are to keep you from getting in, and you're trying to get in by breaking the code. Right? There, there, there's, a, there's a whole industry out there like that. But cryptography or code breaking is the ability to see patterns, whether they're obvious or not obvious. In this class, we will concentrate on the obvious, not on the not obvious. Down the road, like in differential equations, they do a lot of the same stuff, but they have to work with things that sometimes it's less obvious. If I can see a clear, identifiable pattern, then I want to run with it because it will help me now answer the question. A lot of times people will say, well, how many terms do you need to see a pattern? Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> as many as it takes, if a clear underlying pattern exists. The problem often we face in reality is sometimes the sequence can feel so random that you can't figure out a pattern. Or the, it's so complicated that I would never come up with it. Now, mathematically speaking, is it possible there's an algorithm out there that this general term is so complicated and it's got so many terms and quotients and exponents that it generated these as the first four terms, but then something completely different is the fifth term? Is that mathematically yeah. possible? Yeah. Yes. Is it likely? No. Is it plausible? No. Does it have a probability of zero? No, but is it ever going to happen? The answer is actually no. And this is a very important concept. How many have ever heard of the philosophical term Hockham's razor? Some people say Hockham, some say Hockham. What is, in simple English, what does that mean? What, what does it say? I've heard of it, but I'm not sure. Simplest solution. Like yeah, all things being equal, the simplest explanation is probably the correct one. And in this case, it is always the correct one. Why? Because it would be virtually impossible to come up with something so complicated you could get the same simple pattern. Does it actually exist? Maybe. Has anybody ever seen it? No. <laughs> so the, if it seems obvious, then the correct response is it probably is. In fact, from a mathematical standpoint, we will go with what is obvious. So if you see a pattern, you run with it. Everybody cool with that? It's never going to be that complicated thing. But it's not always easy. So, I'm going to ask you a simple question. This is really boring because this one's not in the textbooks. Okay, we'll retire that pin. One, two, four, blank, blank. Don't say it out loud. I'd like you to fill in the missing terms. And I'm hoping it's obvious. 
Because if I can fill in the missing terms, that means I've seen a pattern, then I can clearly state the pattern. Why? Because I might want the thousandth term. And if I want the thousandth term, I really don't want to have to find the first 999. You okay with that? All right, does anybody think they see a pattern? 816. Okay, so Max, what, what's your pattern? Uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Okay, beautiful. Does anybody else see a different pattern? 7, 11. Okay, hold on, slow down. What was your pattern? 7, 11, 12. Hmm. Uh, oh. In the first one, what were you doing? How was it? You were doubling. The second one, you had 1, you had 2, you had 3, you had 4. Are they both correct? Yes, so which one's right? I don't know. The problem is, I did not give you enough information. Now, let me make it really simple. I gave you the fourth term. You now know absolutely what the fifth term is? Yes, so a very, very simple rule, by the way, is you cannot guarantee a pattern exists with fewer than four terms. Now, what if my terms were one, one, one? I'm going with ones, by the way, the rest of the way. You know, one, two, three, probably the same. But here's a simple example where I gave you three terms and two clear patterns emerged. So the rule of thumb we're gonna find along the way when we are trying to establish patterns is we're really probably gonna need four terms most of the time. It might be possible that you see a doubling pattern immediately or a factorial pattern immediately. Usually it takes a few terms for you to see the pattern. It doesn't matter if you do extra terms. There's nothing wrong with that. You just want to find enough terms to where you clearly see a pattern, and then you can state an algorithm, an AN, an nth term. Because once I have the general term, now I can start answering questions that come along the way. Any, any questions so far? This, is, this, is, this part's kind of fun for a lot of people, because there's no calculus in this, at least not yet. Okay? I like not doing calculus in my calculus class. Say again? I like not doing calculus in my calculus <laughs> Well, it's a different type of thinking. Now, there will be some calculus along the way, but not as much. Now, this it's a different level of thinking. In fact, it's as you stand back and look at it, it's a much higher level of thinking. Calculus is important. Calculus is a tool, but calculus is really just algebra and steroids. This is totally different from that. This is very, very different approach, and our goals are very, very different. And when we combine the calculus with, with this stuff, that we can do some really cool things. Now, There is a very important sequence that exists. And by the way, if you think back to your high school, your science class probably had a poster. Almost every high school science class in the country has a poster with this thing in it. It's a very, very famous, very, very important sequence. Now, what I always have fun with this, especially if I have really, really large groups. There's a virus. Some of you, you will see the next term, and then all of a sudden the number of people that sees it doubles, and then that number doubles, and then that number doubles, and all of a sudden you just see it spreading like wildfire. But there will be those among you who are completely immune to this virus, meaning I can write the first 50 terms and we still won't see a pattern. Without, without spilling the beans, anybody want to tell me what the next number is? Five. Five. All right. Now, stare at for a moment. How many, how many now clearly see a pattern? Give a few hands. Okay, what's the next number? Eight. What is it? Eight. Eight. How many now see a pattern? Yeah, we just doubled. Okay, let's do one more number. We'll find out who's immune to this. What's the next number? How many are completely immune to this virus right now, by the way? If we kept going, you'd never see it. <laughs> How did you get the number? Anybody? Add the previous two. Add the previous two. This is what is called A recursion. It is our least favorite type of sequence, but it is ridiculously common. Anything that is defined recursively means I can't tell you the next thing unless I know all of the previous. Oh, oh. Man. So I can't tell you the hundredth turn without knowing the first 99. We don't like that, but there are a lot of things that work that way. So the way this one is defined is like this. The n plus second term is simply the sum of the n plus first and the nth. And I have to start by telling you that the first two terms are both ones. Then I add those together to get the third term. Then I add those two. 
right? So the third term is the sum of the second and the first. So the fourth term is the sum of the third and the second, and so on, and so on, and so on. Does anybody know what this, this is probably the most famous of all recursions. These, this goes forever. Does anybody know what these are called? Fibonacci. Uh, the Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci was a natural scientist. Where do these occur? Does anybody know? Spirals. Things that generate spiral patterns. That is not a tree. A tree is concentric circles. That a lot of people confuse those. So the, I think of three things that come to the top of my head because I've seen them all. Anybody know? Tell me one of the things. They, they live in pine trees. Pine cones. Pine cones, good. We had a house a number of years ago. We bought the house. The whole backyard was filled with these gigantic flowers that love the sun. Sunflowers? Sunflowers. Okay. And bees love hanging out in these guys. Okay. Honeycomb. Yeah, these are all things that have spiral patterns. And it's so cool. And the best part was we actually had gigantic sunflowers. And you could find, and you can actually count. And you can physically see it. It's not rings. It's a spiral. No, it's just, it's interesting. It's cool. The problem is, if I want the hundredth term, you've got to do a lot of work. So I used to teach programming here remember, during the 90s. And one of the problems I would give them is come up with a program that generates the Fibonacci numbers. That wasn't very hard. And then produce the first, I give some large number. I want the hundredth number. And it took so long to run yeah. this. It took so long to run this. I mean, tens of thousands of steps because you have to keep redoing. There sometimes you can actually find, I believe there actually is one that has been discovered that will give you the nth term. But most of the time we don't like recursive definitions. So we did a problem a few minutes ago. And you told me the numbers were 5, 7, 9, 11. What if I said this particular one, the n plus first term, is exactly the nth term plus 2? Would that be a correct statement mathematically? The n plus first term is the previous term plus 2? Yes. Yeah. And I would also have to tell you then that the first term was a 5. Would, would that now give you this sequence? Yeah. I told you the general term, though. That was way more useful. Because if I ask you, given this information, what's the fifth term, you couldn't tell me until you produced the first four. Then you add two more to get the fifth one. What's the 50th term? Oh, shoot, i got to do the first 49. So if I have a general pattern, that's way, way better because it's a lot less work. Okay. Most of the time, we will not be working with recursions. Because recursions, uh, they're just not practical, and it's hard to do the calculus on them. We can do it on this. So our goal is to see patterns where they exist. Everybody with me on that one? So let's start with some simple ones. I'm going to do the simplest ones, the ones that you would have learned in, in remedial algebra. Yeah, we actually do this in, in algebra. So if I define my recursion this way, the n plus first term is equal to the nth term plus d. It's also defined this way that the difference of consecutive terms, this, this is actually the more universal way, although <coughs> both are correct. This says I have the difference between consecutive terms is a constant d, d for difference. This is what is called an arithmetic sequence. That means basically I'm counting by the same number over and over and over again. What I'd like to do is come up with a general pattern. Not because the general pattern is particularly important, but the process of figuring out how to find general patterns is very important. So according to this, I need to tell you a first term. Okay. So let's say our first term is 1. I'm just going to say, given my first term is 1, then can you tell me my second term? Yes. D would be a number I know. I, I want you to count by threes or count by fives. Or you know, count by negative twos. So what would the second term be? Second term would be a two plus d. I'm giving you a one. So what's the second term? It would be the first term. A one plus d. A one plus d. A one and d would be given. Oh, okay. Then what would the third term be? 
Well, then wouldn't that be A2 plus D? A. Which is the same as A1 plus D plus D. Oh, I think I can be a little bit lazy here. Anybody want to go out on a limb and tell me the fourth term? A1 plus 3D. Plus 3Ds. That's way better, isn't it? Uh-huh. Yes, it's A3 plus D, which is A2 plus D plus D plus D, which is A1 plus D plus D. Oh. What is the point of this? I think I see a pattern. So, can you now tell me the nth term in general? A1 plus N D. Almost. N minus 1D. Good, Chase. Caught that. What did, what did you notice? It lagged by one, didn't it? Because my first term, I haven't added to D yet. Oh, so if I said, what's the hundredth term? Haven't you added D 99 times? This is the formula for an arithmetic sequence. That's what I did. So if I told you what the term was. All right, so you just got a new job. Let's say on, let's make it really simple. On January 1st, 2001, uh, maybe your, your parents got a new job, okay, because you, know, you might not have been born yet. We'll keep it simple. And the job paid you, let's say, the job paid $30,000 per year, and you were going to get increases of $2,000 every year, okay? What is the 2040? So let's say you're, 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 you're staying there for life. You're, you're going to retire there. You're going to be there forever. Can you tell me this without finding every year? Yeah. Well, see, at 2002, I'm going to be at 32,000. And then 2003, I'm going to be at 30. I can do it that way. Yeah. Is this an arithmetic sequence? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because. Increasing by a fixed value each time. Okay? In other words, the difference between consecutive years is always going to be 2,000. So what am I asking for? So this is year one. This is year 39. This is year one. Oh, year 40. How about year 40? <laughs> 39 years later, yes. Yeah. If January 1st, 2001, that will be your first year, then 2040 will be your 40th year. So I'm asking for A40. Well, what's my A1? 30,000. 30,000. What's my increase? And how many times? 39. 39 times. So, 108. Think of it this way. You got 39 raises, right, in your 40th year. So what does this come out to be? I think it's 108. Hundred eight thousand. Hundred eight thousand. That's crazy. That is out of control. Okay. <laughs> Arithmetic sequence. Does this have value to us in the long run? No, not really, because the terms are growing without bound. Obviously, that's. But it's still something that we consider because it was how we did it. Now, the more important one, the one that we're actually going to use a lot, certainly over the next week or two, is the one defined this way. The ratio of consecutive terms is constant, R for ratio. If the ratio of consecutive terms is constant, I'll give you an example. Well, let's see. 6 over 2 is 3. 18 over 6 is 3. Aha, uh -huh. I have a constant ratio, don't I? This is called a geometric sequence. And we consider this one very, very valuable. So a geometric, uh, in the arithmetic, I was adding the same. Here I'm multiplying the same. OK? <coughs> so in this situation here, I can rewrite it like this. I'm always multiplying the previous term by the same value. By the way, R can be positive, R can be negative, R large, R can be small. 
the ones that we're most interested in have small R's, by the way. We're interested in things that get smaller as we go, not bigger. Because bigger as we go means infinite at some point. So the second term would be the first term times R. Agreed? What would the third term be? Well, it would be the second term times R, which would be the first term times R times R. Oh. U. What's the fourth term, do you think? A times R cubed. A times R cubed. Oh. We're, we're going to be lazy right off the bat. We'll, little dot, dot, dot action here. Can you tell me the nth term then? A1 times R to the n minus 1. Turns out this one's really important and really, really useful. Really, really useful. Now, this, this situation here was kind of artificial. Okay? In other words, giving you a constant raise every year. What if you were at the high end of the company? That 2,000 wouldn't amount to very much, would it? If you're at the low end, it's huge. How are most raises given? Not as fixed dollar amounts, but as Percentage. percentages. Okay, so you're going to go back and say, you know what? They were offering me a percentage increase instead, okay? But let's say the percentage increase, you could do the $2,000 per year, or you could just do 5%. So you decided to do the 30,000 and then a 5% per year increase. Does that seem reasonable? I mean, that would be, I mean, I've been at Mesa, this is my 38th year, and I've gotten raises in like, I don't know, 24 of them or something. I got raised with like seven years. <laughs> and when we got raises, they were 2.7%, like clockwise. Yeah. Again, you want to be rich? Teaching's probably not the way to go, unless you do like me, you teach until you're 100. Okay, I said jokingly. Yeah, our raises are really small when they happen. And I said, so why don't I get raised? Because I've been at the top of the food chain for about seven or eight years. <laughs> there's, nowhere, there's nowhere left to go. How do I do this one? What is my R? My A1 is clearly 30,000. My R is? 1.05. Good. See, if my R is 0 0.05, that means I made less money every year, and it's going to zero really quickly, isn't it? So when you get the raise, your raise is 5%, but your salary is not 5%. Your salary is 105%. Agreed? That's the one we sometimes forget. So 1.05. So you took the 5% rather than the 2,000 per year. Well, in that first year, your raise was only $1,500. You should have gone with the 2,000, right? No. No. What is year 40 in this case? Uh, 201,000. Wait, wait, slow, slow down, slow down, slow down. So it's this times what? So, times 1.05 to the 39th. Good. Now here's the nice thing, I don't need to find all 40 years, I'm only asking you for the 40th year. So everyone try this on your, on your own. Let's see if we all get the same numbers. And you found that this salary, it's a little better. Mm -hmm. What was it? $201,142.53. Ah, a lot better, isn't it? Hmm. Now, populations generally don't grow at a constant rate, but over finite periods of time, they usually do. Right? We talked about population growth earlier. And I think I may have used this example because I remember when my kids were going through elementary school, one of the questions they would always come up with in math, not in history or social studies, was they would use India and China. You guys remember that question? Yeah. The population of India is this, the population of China is this, India is growing at this rate, China is growing at this rate. India's rate was greater than China's rate, which means at some point in the future, India would pass up China. And then they had to figure out, usually they had them just kind of trial and error, you know, because they hadn't learned logarithms and things like that yet. But it's an interesting problem. What we're saying is we're going to grow at a constant rate, literally making population a geometric sequence. It would be if we're growing at a constant rate over a long period of time. It would be geometric during that period of time. So they were doing the exact same problem, and then they say, oh, in this year, you know, that's when they would pass each other up. Now, the problem is population growth rates don't stay the same from, you know, forever. 
maybe for a short period of time or even a few years. So this is a geometric sequence, kind of nice to work with. What we really like about geometric sequences, though, is if the R is small and the terms are getting smaller as we go, because then it's easier to work with, you know, things are, these are going to balloon out of control at some point, aren't they? See, if this person lives forever, <laughs> you never know, right? They might live a long time. That, that salary doesn't have an upper limit. Now, the classic question, <clears throat> This is one I remember hearing when I was a kid. Uh, we are in March. March has 31 days. Calendar, okay. Okay. Just to make, I don't care what day of the week we are, but there's the first, and so on. All right. So, you've all heard versions of this. All right. Um, I, want you to, I want you to slay the dragon. Let's keep it simple. And if you, I'm the king. If you slay the dragon, you get, you know, my daughter's hand in marriage or my son's hand in marriage, whichever way you want to go here. And I'll also give you a million dollars. Oh, sweet. So Max says to me, he goes, no. I, I don't want to, you know, bankrupt the system, you know, I, I, just give me a penny, but I want you to double it every day. Huh. So, Max says, I'll take the penny. So on day one, I'm not asking for the total amount, I'm just saying how much you're going to get each day. So on day one, he gets a penny. So day two, and then day three, and then day four. You know, I think, I think this would really help if you were trying to lose weight, right? So at the end of the first week, you've got all of 64 cents as your paycheck. And then we keep going, right? Finally, a happy meal can, you know, is out there for the taken. Ooh, now maybe I can get, I can get steak at some point. Okay. So, so after about two weeks, you know, Max, Max lost like 30 pounds because he hasn't eaten anything because he still has to pay rent and stuff. Bad move on Max's part? No. Well, Let's keep going. is this a geometric sequence? Yes. Okay, let's identify the important pieces of this. A1 was, well, one penny. Yeah, two. But what's R? Two. R is two. Mm -hmm. I'm doubling each day. No, that's right. I'm doubling. Yeah, doubling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me day 21 now. What's A21? A1 times. I'm not adding them. I'm just saying how much this is. He gets paid every day in cash. R in the 20. So that's going to be what? 0, 0.0. In other words, I just kept going. What number is going to appear, appear right here? So it's going to be 0, 1. Oops, I brought that twice. Times what? 15 million. Times 2 to the 20th power. So what's, what's Max getting on that 21st day? 10, around 10,000? So what was it exactly? $1,485.76. You know, not bad for a day's work. So Max is like, you know, I do that for 30 days. That's $300,000. You have 31 days in March. So what's Max's 31 day value here? I, 10 million 730 <laughs> so max is saying on that day oh on, on day 31 he's getting 10 mil well a little more than 10 mil that's right Oops. not bankrupt everything take all the money does that kind of i don't know does that sort of defy belief there They're like wait a minute First two weeks, he's starving to death, and on the 31st day, he gets over 10 million. That day, that day, he gets over 10. By the way, he's, it's well over 21 million for the month, just in case you wanted to add them all up. We'll do that on another day, like next day. Geometric sequences grow very, very fast if the R is bigger than one. We just saw that with the income example a moment ago. So Max is looking real smart about right now. So he not only got you know the, the princess's hand, he got 
many millions of dollars, and, and basically the king now works, works for him, right? He, he kind of took over the kingdom. How many have heard of this example before? You've seen this in some capacity. Yeah, it, it's beautiful because she's like, it just totally catches you off guard. So, wow, I, I didn't think of it that way. And the reason is because A1 was so small. Remember, my 30th day, I'm multiplying something by 2 to the 30th power. That's astronomically large, right? 2 to the 30th power is over what? Uh, billion. It's over a billion. <laughs> oh, okay, that's why this. So geometric means there's a constant ratio between terms. Arithmetic means there's a constant difference between terms. But the point here was not geometric or arithmetic in general. It was how do I find a general term if I can, if I see something happening? So now, we're going to be working with things. Now, I want to remind you guys, um, we have not worked with factorials yet in this class, have we? Not, not particularly. So I want to remind you, OK, because we're going to be working with these every day from now on. Everybody knows what this is, right? M. I've got to do that. Okay. I can't help myself. No, that's not an exclamation point. It's no. a factorial. factorial. Or it's a really loud N. <coughs> First of all, factorial is defined for a positive integer. Start with a positive integer. Then this is N times N minus 1 times N minus 2 down 3 to 1 if N is large. Doesn't end in 0, because if it ended in 0, then all factorials would be 0. zero. <laughs> but that would make them easy if they were all 0, but that wouldn't really make much sense. So what's 5 factorial? So that's 120. Um, find the key on your calculator. We're going to be working a lot with factorials over the coming weeks. I mean, they're going to be part of many, many answers. So I want it to be something you're comfortable with. For those who've worked with permutations and combinations and you've maybe got stats, you're very used to these things. We're not doing that in this class, but we will work with factorials because they show up in our patterns very, very often. Okay. <clears throat> So again, find this on your calculator. Now, factorials are probably the fastest growing of all functions, strangely enough. They, they grow really, really fast. So if you have a powerful graphing calculator, you can probably do larger numbers. Most of you don't. So if I asked you to do, let's just say, 68 factorial on your calculator, it's going to give you a scientific notation answer because it's so big. But that's on the order of, because I'm not, right, there's a lot of, a lot of decimal. What is it on the order of? 2.48 times 10 to the 96. 2.48 times 10 to the 96. 2.48 times 10 to the 96. Okay. 69 factorial, which would be 69 times that, is on the order of about? 1.71 times 10 to the 98. And then I got 70 factorial. Well, I want to remind you of something. We know this. Is this the same as 5 times 4 factorial? Is that the same as 5 times 4 times 3 factorial? Yeah. Yeah, that type of factorial manipulation can be really, really helpful. I'm going to show you in a moment why. Uh, my stats class, we do this kind of stuff all the time. So isn't this equal to then 70 times 69 factorial? <coughs> yeah, we're already at over Yeah, so 70 times 1.71 is about 120. So this is about 120. Times 10 to the 98th, which would be 1.2 times 10 to the 100th. But what are your calculators saying? We're already at overflow error. How come? Because we went above 10 to the 100th power. Yeah, your calculators, unless you have a really powerful graphing calculator, probably doesn't go beyond 10 to the 99th. Now, I happen to have a TI 89 titanium. I can go up to 449 factorial, which is approximately 10 to the 999th power, and then it craps out. Computer, supercomputer UCSD can go up to like 1,000 factorial. In other words, the limits of human technology don't get us really past 1,000 factorial, but numbers, 1,000 is not very big when I'm thinking infinite. Yeah, factorials are the fastest growing things, and we can't do the calculations for large ones, at least not this way. There is a trick. I will show you a different time. There is actually a trick to calculate outrageous involved logarithms and exponentials. It's, it's, it's actually a really cool trick, okay? So one of the questions, I taught the math portion of the GRE over at San Diego State for a few years pre-pandemic. The GRE is what most of you will be taking in the next two years. It's like the SAT for grad school. 
So you want to go to grad school, everybody takes the GRE. It's math and English. And then if you're STEM particularly, you're going to take a subject specific one. So when I took my GRE way back when, I did the math and English and then did a math. Again. Yeah. Well, the math and English is low level math and English and then the math specific. So I did a three hour test, a few minutes, and then another three hour test. Yeah. My daughter, the chemist, she did that in the three hour chemistry test. I have a friend who's a computer science, did that and then did the computer science one. It's gnarly, but it's everybody uses this. You don't always have to take the subject specific, but the math portion was only algebra, statistics, geometry. The algebra nobody has difficulty with. The stats I got you through mean, median, mode, factorials and things. And the geometry I spent the most time on because that's the thing that was usually furthest from people's memories and a lot of vocab. But here's a question that shows up. Here's a typical question that shows up on the GRE. Now, you don't get a calculator on the GRE. How many have ever taken any type of math placement test on a computer? So you have the little calculator in the corner yeah. that adds, subtracts, multiplies, divides, nothing else, and there's no order of operations. Yeah. Which means that if you have any stuff going on, you're not going to necessarily even get the right answer. That's, can you imagine? Okay, so the GRE people, they have that calculator on, in the corner. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. Um, will you do this? Everyone do this on your own calculator. Go 100 factorial divided by 98 factorial on your calculator and tell me what it happens. It should say, it should say overflow error again. Yeah. Because both numbers are way beyond what your calculator can do. Yet this is a question on a GRE where they can't even use a calculator. Shouldn't it be, what do you think, um, Ryan? Shouldn't it be 9,900? 9, 9, because this is what you would want to do. In other words, be a little bit smarter than the calculator. Oh. And the answer is 9,900, correct? Yeah. So, one of the reasons you need to know how to manipulate factorials is there's going to be times you need to do a calculation and you might not be able to do it directly on the calculator, yet it wasn't a complicated calculation. Is I know the rules of factorials. Oh, I can cancel factorials. Beautifully. <clears throat> okay? Beautifully I can cancel factorials. Things like this. This is the kind of stuff we want to be able to do. So sometimes we'll be doing stuff like this. <clears throat> I'll say, okay, my first term, let's, let's keep it real simple. The first term was a, was a one, and then my second term was a one, and then my third term was a one half, and then my fourth term was a one sixth, and then my fifth term was a one over 24. And I, I don't even know when to stop. I just keep going, and boy, it'd really be nice if I saw a pattern here. Okay. Well, there actually is a really clear pattern, but I don't know what it is exactly yet. But I just saw some of those numbers previously. Now, for those of you who know permutations and combinations, we deal with those a little bit. We'll, we'll do some of those later on. Those are coefficients in the binomial expansion. Zero factorial comes up a lot. I'll give you a really simple example. Okay, there's 45 people in this room. I'm going to take a person at random to lunch today. How many ways could I do that? There's 45 of you in here. 45, because there's 45. But if I said two or more, it's a little bit more dicey calculation. I want to go to lunch today. How many ways can I take none of you? One. One way, and that's to take no, no. none of you. The calculation of none of you involves zero factorial. You can't do that without zero factorial in the calculation. So on your calculator, everybody do zero factorial. And what do you get? One. One. It's not zero. Remember, factorials don't go to zero, they go to one. This, all your life you've been told, well, it, it just is, don't question, it's a definition. No, it's not. It's actually a calculated value using something called the gamma function, which you're going to learn in differential equations. My Diffie Q class is about four weeks away from that. The gamma function is a really scary function that, when integrated, produces factorials, and therefore, when you can calculate zero factorial, it's not a definition. But it is a result that's really useful. And if you always, in, in case you forget, you can always do it on your calculator. So zero factorial does come up, and it comes up a lot actually in calculation. Hmm. You know, if I didn't know any better, I'd say that looks like one over five factorial. Four, three, two, one. That looks like one over four factorial. Hmm. And what would that one be? One over zero factorial. Do you see a clear identifiable pattern? What do you think it is? One over n minus one factorial. Beautiful. The parentheses are important there. 
That type of mathematics over the next month is going to be one of the most common things we do. Factorial patterns are one of the most common ones we're going to see. And the nice thing is, you don't have to do a lot of terms to see them. You didn't see them with the ones, did you? But the two, the six, the 24, you go, wait a minute, two factorial, three factorial, four factorial, now I work backwards. Oh, OK. Now, there's no question we're going to answer yet. I just want us to be able to see a pattern. Okay, That is one. That's probably the most common one, but the second most common one is probably exponential patterns. And what I mean by exponential patterns, I see things of this nature. You know, I see 1, and then 2, and then 4, and then 8, and then 16, and on and on and on. This is not geometric, or is it? It is, but I'd rather do it a different way. If that's a1 and a2 and a3, what's a n? It is geometric, but it's the r that I'm interested in, in other words, because there is definitely an exponential pattern there. Right. What's being raised to a power? Q two. Two. You all agree it's two to a power, but, it's double. but to what power? Is it two to the n? Yeah. Because when n is one, I don't get minus one. Is it, does everyone see that? So this is an exponential pattern. Those are the two most common type. And the nice thing is, not only are they common, they're the easiest ones to recognize and identify. You are not going to be doing code breaking. You're not going to be doing cryptography. For some of you, that actually could be a field of interest, but that's, you're talking probably graduate courses <laughs> way down the road. There's a lot of in-between courses that you fill in a lot of the blanks. The ability to recognize a pattern, I cannot teach you that. There are certain things, there are skills that you have. I can teach you how to clearly look for things and recognize things. Some of you can do things in your head. I have a brother who used to be able to, this was just a weird skill. As a kid, he taught himself to speak backwards. When you would say something to him, he would immediately repeat it back to you backwards. Mm -hmm. Like if you played it on a tape recorder and then reversed the recording, it would sound more or less normal. Yeah, I, I, that, that was a strange skill to be said. Okay? As a child, I could convert fractions to decimals. I couldn't tell you how. I can still do that. I can't tell you how, as long as I don't think about it. So when I'm doing the numbers and I'm waiting for everyone else, I've already got the answer long before you got to your calculator. I can't explain it, and I can't teach it. Okay? Can anybody here dunk a basketball? In your life, was anybody here ever able to dunk a basketball? Maybe when you were younger and in better shape? I don't know. Okay. Um, I can't teach you how to dunk a basketball if you're five foot two. I can teach you how to jump higher. I've trained, I've trained hundreds, if not thousands, of athletes in my lifetime. I can teach you how to do things, but I can't teach you to dunk if you're short. <laughs> What's the old expression? You can't teach height. I can teach you certain things, but there are certain skills that you already have in your head. You already can do certain things. You can do them very, very well. Anybody here a fast reader? Really fast. My oldest daughter, the chemist, I remember when she was in elementary school, she would go upstairs with a book, like, you know, 300 page book, and she'd come down an hour later and be done. That took me a week. I'm like the slowest reader you've ever seen. My, my daughter could read entire books in, in a day, long books. So she would read book series over the course of a week. I, and my, both my daughters can do that. I don't know how. I, I didn't teach them that, but they, they can read more than 10 times as fast as I can read and with perfect retention. I, I have no idea how. I don't know how any human being can do that, speed reading. But some people have that innate ability. I cannot teach you to code break, but I can teach you to see the obvious. And when I mean obvious, I mean this is what I mean by obvious. It's not going to get much harder than this. Okay? But seeing patterns is actually a very important thing. Um, I have a friend, years ago, he was going on a job interview. Now, this guy was a marketing whiz. He wasn't a math person. But he, he knew people, and he really understood money, and he, he was really good at what he did. But he went for an interview at a really, it was like a high-level company, and they asked him questions that had nothing to do, it seemed, with anything he was doing. And I remember the questions because I've asked these same questions to people, because you guys are going to be engineers. You're going to be put on the spot in exactly the same way, maybe not the same questions. One question was, there's a young man who had, he had girlfriends in two different cities. He didn't have a car, so what he would do is go to the train station, and the train 
to one, to one girl's town and the other girl's town, each of them ran six times an hour every 10 minutes, but they didn't go at the exact same time. So it might be 5 o'clock, 5, 10, 5, 20. So he'd go to the train station and he'd get on whichever train came first. And he'd get on that train and he'd go to that city and, and be with that girlfriend. As it turns out, over a long period of time, he started keeping track. He noticed he was going to visit one girl exactly 90% of the time and the other one only 10% of the time. And he asked the person in the interview, can you explain this? So he gave this big, long psychological explanation that deep down he really favored the one over the other and all this stuff. And he told me this question. I just laughed. I said, really? You didn't figure that out before he finished telling you the question? This was a question of, I also heard the same question. A friend who was interviewing for an engineering job got asked the exact same question. Anybody know the answer? It's real simple. The trains leave one minute apart. If one leaves at 5, the other one leaves at 501. 510, 511. So that means for nine of the 10 minutes, one train is going to be there before the other. Of every 10 minute period, nine of them, the one train is there before the other. Does that make sense? From 501 right up till 510, you got one train, then at 510, you got the other. So if he leaves on the one that comes first, one of them is 90%. The second question he got asked, which was even a funnier question, and I have seen versions of this because sometimes people brought their questions home. When you are interviewing for the job, they're not going to ask you to do a calculus problem, pencil and paper. It doesn't work like that. They're going to ask you to problem solve. And it was a sequence. They said, here is a sequence. Can you tell me the next number? And I hate to say it, but he told me the question. I was like, yeah, it's easy. And he said they didn't tell him what the next number was because they wanted to keep reusing the question. Sometimes you have to think outside of the box. This is code breaking. How many here are computer scientists? That's going to be one of the most important skills you have. Why do you have to be able to code break if you're computer science? You're never going to be hired to break somebody's code. No, but if you can't code break, how do you improve upon? You understand? You, um, one of the questions I always have in my upper level classes, I said you have to find questions the calculator cannot do. You have to find ways literally to screw up technology. When I was a grad student at UCSD, they asked us to come up with problems that the supercomputer could not do, simple matrix algebra problems. So I came up with a really simple problem, two variable question. I came up with a really simple problem that I could do in 30 seconds, pencil and paper. And the supercomputer at UCSD could not because of how computers would do matrix problems. And the answer was, you know, one comma one, and the supercomputer was coming up with numbers in the thousands. It's called an ill-conditioned matrix. I chose just the right coefficients. Okay, 803 was the magic number. If you choose 803 as the denominator, at that point it was the longest number we had available where the sequence of repeating digits was so long the computer couldn't store them all. So it was impossible to answer any question with that as a denominator. Why is it important to do this? Because then we can improve upon the technology. You're standing on the shoulders of the people that came before you. You always have to find weaknesses. Does anybody, you just can't help when the new thing comes out, technology, you gotta buy it. Anybody in that position? Or the new car, the new whatever. I, I, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna wait for at least fourth generation, no matter what it is. Never gonna buy the first one, why? Okay. Terrible. The second one's gonna be a lot better. It's gonna be perfect. No, the third one's going to be better, but probably not as many improvements. Why? Because we find the kinks. Every time a new version comes out, you find the flaws in the old one. Why? It's important to find the flaws. It's important. Okay? This is a question that somebody was asked, and they didn't answer it, and they didn't get offered that job. They ended up getting a job later somewhere else. Decent job. <laughs> Friendlier questions. 